This video is sponsored by Brilliant. The first 200 to use the link in the description get 20% off the annual subscription. On November 8, 2016, at 8.15 pm, TVs across India flickered in unison. Dramas, cricket matches, and game shows were all replaced with the face of Prime Minister Modi. In this unscheduled surprise address, he announced the 500 and 1,000 rupee banknotes, worth about 7 and 14 US dollars respectively, would soon lose their status as legal tender. Without any monetary value, they would become nothing but pieces of paper, useless for any and all transactions. Soon meant in 3 hours and 45 minutes, effective immediately at midnight. And those 500 and 1,000 rupee bills constituted no less than 86% of all cash in circulation. It was as if the US president suddenly announced all 10 and 20 dollar bills were worthless, only with a population four times bigger and far more reliant on cash. The next few months were the result of a fascinating unintended experiment. As 1.3 billion people scrambled to replace their cash, the government rushed to print new bills, and dozens of people died in the process. India runs on cash. It's estimated that, measured by volume, 90 to 98% of all transactions in the country involve physical currency. And 85% of workers are paid in cash, while only about half of the population owns a bank account. These are optimal conditions for tax theft, making it extremely easy and extremely common for earnings to go unreported, and thus unknown and untracked by the government. The informal, underground economy makes up something like 25-40% to 40 of the nation's GDP. While salaried workers have taxes automatically withheld from their paychecks, they represent only a tenth of all organized workers. Farmers, meanwhile, who make up about half the population's workforce, are largely exempt, protected from politicians by their large voting power, not unlike seniors in the United States. In 2016, only 37 million Indians filed tax returns, 10 million of which were exempt, leaving only a tiny 27 million payers in a country of 1.3 billion. Modi's solution was simple, force everyone to report their earnings. From November 9th, Indians had until December 30th to take their 500 and 1,000 rupee notes to the bank. There, they could be deposited for their full value, or exchange for other notes at the counter, for a maximum of 4,000 rupees per person per day, later increased to 4,500, and then reduced to 2,000. Tax avoiders, big and small, now had no choice but to declare their wealth, or lose it all come January. Any strange, large deposits without explanatory paperwork would be an instant red flag for the government. But here's where everything went wrong. The central bank couldn't prepare millions of new replacement banknotes in secret. Printing them in advance would therefore attract attention, potentially cause chaos, and alert the very criminals the policy was meant to target. For this reason, the Reserve Bank could only start printing the new 500 and 2,000 rupee notes after the announcement, leaving it with just under four hours to reprint the vast majority of the second most populous nation's currency. Clearly, it was an impossible task. Now, having to bring cash to deposit or exchange would have been disruptive enough for many Indians. But because the new banknotes were in such short supply, long lines formed outside banks and ATMs for months. On top of that, the replacement bills were slightly smaller, requiring ATMs to be retrofitted to use them. There were lawsuits, strikes, and protests against what many saw as an unreasonable interference by the government in daily life. And despite all that, there's good reason to be skeptical the policy achieved its intended effects. Broadly speaking, there were two goals of demonetization. First, to weaken terrorist funding, and second, to target the informal black economy both of which are hard to measure. Whether terrorist groups suffered any significant losses as a result of demonetization, no one knows with certainty. And the black market is problematic precisely because it can't be measured. What we do know, according to the Reserve Bank of India itself, is that 99.3% of the demonetized notes were later returned. In other words, the policy removed only a tiny amount of money from circulation. 
Experts largely agree black money is mostly stored in the form of gold, silver, real estate, and overseas bank accounts, not bills worth 7 or 14 US dollars each. It's true that demonetization added a record 9 million new taxpayers, but the mass disruption it caused also removed nearly the same amount. 8.8 .8 million people stopped paying that year, likely as a result of lost income. And while digital payments experienced a significant spike in usage, there was no lasting effect after the new banknotes were fully distributed. Three years later, the only certain outcome of demonetization was the immediate chaos it created across the nation. Hours wasted at the bank, financial uncertainty for those most vulnerable, lost wages, and at least several innocent lives. Worse, it came out of nowhere, not as a response to inflation or unrest. So why then, given all that we now know, is the policy still so popular in India, among those who personally paid its costs? Like Xi Jinping's consolidation of power in China, Modi successfully sold a story of unfairness, of targeting corruption and criminals, to ultimately gain political support. Soon after, Modi's party won the 2017 elections of its 200 million person most populous state in India, thanks in part to the popular belief that demonetization was a collective sacrifice necessary to make the rich pay their fair share. Anyone who protested the policy could easily be labeled as a criminal trying to hide black money. Rather than turning the population against the government, demonetization enlisted it, making people feel they were personally doing their part to help fight crime. Modi's party could have passed just as effective but less disruptive laws targeting black money and explained them to gain support. Instead, he knew the most effective way to convey information is by showing people firsthand. Demonetization achieved its real goal of driving political support by making a faraway abstract concept tangible and interactive. Likewise, Brilliant is a math, science, and computer science website that uses interactive teaching, but for good. If you've ever wondered how Google can search through literally billions of results in less than a second, or how to win poker with probability, or how computers learn new things on their own, Brilliant is for you. One puzzle or game or story at a time, it takes you from the very basics through to the most advanced. Because you're watching this video, I know you like to learn new things, so why not check out Brilliant and see which of their over 60 topics you'd like to learn next. You can use the link in the description to start learning whatever interests you most for free, and the first 200 people will get 20% off the annual premium subscription, so you can view all the daily challenges and unlock dozens of problem-solving courses. Thanks to Brilliant and to you for watching this video.